Well, Aubrey and I have previously, on other panels, disagreed about how... <laughs> we don't disagree on the idea that we can enormously transform the aging process. I mean, I do that for a living. For the last 35 years, I get paid because I can produce much longer-lived organisms and analyze how that happens genetically and physiologically. Um, so I know it's a reality because it, I make it happen in my lab. And Aubrey and I, for years, in my case, first in 1984, I said in New Scientist, we could do this for people, here's one strategy. Aubrey has his strategy. My opinion is that the strategies that I've proposed, I've now proposed three in public, uh, will work better than Aubrey's strategy. And of course, Aubrey disagrees with that. Yeah. So, but it's, there we are. It's, kept, it's, it's kept civil, right? It's been kept civil. Yeah, there's no screaming, but I'm a Canadian. So what? <laughs> A recovering Canadian. Recovering Canadian. I'm still a Canadian. Is there a common ground between the molecular biologist and the, and the evolutionary biologist? Well, the genomics show. I mean, uh, the genomics show that there's tons of molecular biology involved. There's no question. It's all molecular biology. The real difference of opinion is how complicated is that molecular biology. That's where you do have a salient difference. In my world, it's very complex. That doesn't mean it's impossible to resolve, because now in this century, we have genomic tools which are spectacularly powerful. So the genomic complexity of aging doesn't scare genomicists. Okay. Aubrey, we're going to go to you. Besides not shaving, what's the secret here? For... <laughs> uh, yeah, the not shaving does help because if I did shave my beard off, my wife would kill me. Okay, there you would go. Definitely <laughs> defeat I told you these guys were smart. <laughs> um, How do you disagree with Michael? Well, um, I, it, it's, I, it's great good fortune for me to be speaking last because really I think it's going to be possible for me to emphasize how I broadly agree with everyone else on the panel and only in a subtle way um, uh, have a difference of emphasis. Um, but certainly the conclusions that I come to in terms of the time frames within which we have a respectable chance of making a very substantial difference to the age at which functional decline sets in and ill health sets in and, of course, mortality follows. Um, you know, th th those conclusions are very different, very much more um, uh, dramatic, I guess, than what most of my colleagues feel. Um, if we could have um, the first visual that I had, I forget which order I had them to do in, um, the, 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 uh, the graphs. No, the other one. Put the other one up for the first. <laughs> All right, so um, this is my understanding of what Michael is saying we might be able to do in terms of combating aging. Michael has observed that over a, long, a large proportion of the natural lifespan of his fruit flies and indeed of humans and so on, there is an increase in the risk of death. And then that increase appears, from a statistical point of view anyway, essentially to cease. So you get a flat line. That's where I've, uh, what I've labeled normal aging. And what I believe Michael hopes to be able to do in the future is to slow aging down, as indicated by the blue or the red lines, but to have this cessation of aging kick in at pretty much the same chronological age as it would before aging was slowed down. No. Nope. Um, well, I must have just not listened hard enough to your talks in the past. Um, 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 now, I think, that that's a, that's, I think that's possible. I think that might happen. However, I also think it might happen that what we see is what we see in the red line, where, in fact, the um, risk of death continues to rise until most of the individuals of the original population are dead, same as we see in normal aging. 